Hey everyone, it's great to see you again, or you can see me. I can't really see you, but I can imagine you. I can use my historical imagination. My name is Paul Ortiz. I'm the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and a professor of history um, at UF. And um, Lori uh, Taylor and, and her colleagues at um, the libraries had asked uh, Deborah Hendricks and I to do kind of a, um, a follow-up uh, oral history workshop because the time we had together when you were on campus in Gainesville was really productive, but obviously hurried. So we wanted to have the opportunity to talk to you a little more about um, some of the, the uh, kind of uh, ins and outs of oral history. Um, Deborah is gonna talk more about kind of the technical um, digital production, um, preservation uh, aspects of oral history. Uh, because you are all um, have some kind of administrative, you know, teaching, uh, service uh, capacities at your respective institutions, this will be a different kind of workshop than we usually do. What I'm going to talk about actually is a little bit about how to set up an oral history project. And also I want to talk about publications because that's a big issue for us in academia, both for uh, us uh, as, as, as faculty uh, or staff professionals, uh, but also for our students, our graduate students, our undergraduates, and so we want to talk a little bit about oral history and publication. So when we were together uh, earlier in the summer, and this is going to be a little unconventional because I'm going to kind of glance over my, my keyboard, uh, my, my monitor periodically, so please forgive me. Hopefully that's not too distracting. Um, we have some documents on the website of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program that we have found to be very useful for folks across the world who call us or email and they'll say, hey, I, I found your workshop materials. Uh, we use them to set up this project in Australia or uh, China or someplace in Latin America. So this is kind of stress tested material by this point. Um, one of the documents you'll find if you go to the Proctor Oral History Program um, and you go through the uh, tab uh, the, let me see, I think it's the research tab. It is the research tab. And you can click through and find tutorials beginning an oral history project. And if you're watching from the comfort of home with the internet connection, I'll give you a sec to dial into that. Um, I've created a document called Eight Steps to Doing Oral History. And because, uh, uh, because I love jazz music, it had to be like eight, it had to be uh, steps. It's kind of like John Coltrane's Giant Steps, although I would never compare myself, obviously, to John Coltrane. Um, but the eight steps, what I mean by this is, is beginning with thinking about how to start an oral history project and then going all the way to that, that, those final questions about thinking about a final project, but also permanent access for future generations and communities. Um, we have to be cognizant of the fact that as uh, oral historians and digital scholars, we're constantly being approached by folks who have shoebox collections, right? I'm sure many of you have had this experience. Someone brings in a sh literally a shoebox full of cassette tapes or a slightly larger box maybe full of reel-to-reel -reel recordings or maybe even an older case with wire recordings. We even have those here. And so one of the things I want us to think about is not just the interview process, but what happens after and what, what we can do as digital scholars to shepherd interviews and productions, they may be public programs that happened 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, what can we do to make those accessible? Uh, what can we do to make sure that those find an audience? Um, and let me give you one, one example as kind of a preface. Um, we rediscovered, well, a couple of rediscoveries we made, I think I may have mentioned one of these when you were on campus, one of the rediscoveries was a special public program that featured a dialogue between the, the towering intellectuals, James Baldwin, Chinue Achebe, and Francis Bebe. You know, three of the, the prominent writers worldwide who actually came to the University of Florida in 1981. And we didn't realize we had that recording. Um, it was an audio recording. Deborah may talk more about it, but I believe Deborah it was real to real. And we were lucky because it was a public program and we believe it may have been professionally recorded. So the sound quality is really well. It was really good. There's, there's a few glitches here and there. What we did with it was we transcribed it. We put it out on social media. And in, this, in the spring of 2020, we're partnering with colleagues in different units on campus to put together a public program about that 1981 dialogue. 
um, because you have Achebe, Baldwin, and Bebe talking about these gigantic themes, you know, like political struggle in the African diaspora, the struggles against racism, uh, colonization, you know, um, anti-colonialism, post-colonialism, everything, you know, you can imagine. So it's really exciting to think about what we can do as digital scholars to bring those older recordings and events to, to, to life. So starting an oral history project, what I like to, to do when I sit down with scholars or community organizations is really ask them to think about, number one, what's the outcome of your project? Or what, what do you see, what do you want to have as the outcome or outcomes of your project? That may seem counterintuitive because we haven't even talked about who we want to interview yet. But it's important to, to begin with outcomes because that really requires us to, to come face to face with issues like you know, resources, uh, timing. Uh, number one, do we have enough resources to do the kind of project we want to do? Um, and if we don't, where do we get those resources? Uh, the timing, we're all busy. And so it's great to start an oral history project, but as Deborah Hendricks can tell you, these projects begin to kind of you know add up over time, right? And so that's why we want to start by thinking about the outcomes. Again, um, this could be, and I think we talked about this when you're on campus, outcome doesn't mean one thing. Uh, it can mean many things. For us as digital scholars who are mainly university-based, one very important outcome that we value here at UF is a public program. You know, where you, you, you do an interview project, you interview a group of individuals, they could be military veterans, they could be anti-colonial, you know, movement veterans, you know, they could be political officials, all of the above retired educators, so on and so forth. And with the public program outcome, we factor that into a lot of our interview work, which means that at a certain point in, in, in the process of doing the oral history project, we're going to present it publicly. And we're going to try to, to get as wide an audience as we can. Now, you may be only aiming for an academic audience on campus. That's fine. But just think about different conduits or different kind of circuits, if you will, of, of knowledge that you can kind of push the, the interview content out and, you know, and find different audiences. Thanks to digital production now, concurrent with, with the, the real renaissance of radio, uh, especially internet-based radio, our students now are finding new pathways to really promote their work. You know, back in the day, when we only had analog radio, it was, it was really a challenge to get an interview or even a documentary onto a mainstream radio station. That's no longer the case. Uh, most universities either are, you know, have radio stations and or have faculty or staff who are connected to, to, to a radio station. So that's one thing to think about. You know, internet-based radio gives us a wonderful, again, you know, platform for our work. So that could be an outcome. You may want to partner at the outset with a radio station if your university, again, has a relationship to a radio station um, or, or you even want to establish one. Um, who will have access to your interviews? Thanks to the era of the Creative Commons that I'm actually going to pull up, you know, we, we talked about this to a certain extent when you're on campus. But the, the, the Creative Commons forms now allow us to, to really um, be much more inclusive and put our narrators. Now in the Proctor program, we call interviewees narrators. It allows, the, the Creative Commons license uh, gives us a lot more um, you know, clear language that we can share with our narrators in advance of an interview to say that, hey, this really belongs to you, but we need you to sign this form for us to be able to process, to use this material, to put it out there in an educational um, you know, context. What I'd like to propose is to send this updated Creative Commons uh, license form to you, you know, so that you'll be able to see the language that, that's, that's, that we use. I mean, a lot of you no doubt already use this form or variation of it. I like the Creative Commons license form uh, because it allows us to add it, you know, to put in addendum, addendums. So for example, let me share you one addendum we just did. I mean, this is real time, okay? Uh, 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 we just wrote this up today for a project with the family 
of a very prominent musician. How prominent? Um, uh, well, let me just share with you that if you were in Liverpool, England right now, and I mentioned the, the person's name, uh, everyone would probably know who they were. Uh, that's how prominent this person is or was. Um, and so we're doing a project with the, with the musician who's deceased with uh, his family. And we use the, the, the template of the Creative Commons license, you know, uh, discourse, which, which is online. But our addendum was added in the, the following words. This interview cannot be used for commercial purposes without the express written consent of the individual or individuals providing the content for the interview. And, you know, most of the people that I've ever interviewed don't need this kind of, of language, but people who are worried or have experience of, of people monetizing their life stories are much more sensitive to this issue. And it's really not bad. In fact, I may suggest for our program that we just kind of keep this actually in the form for all the interviews that we do. So, you know, again, at the outset of the project, you want to think about who will have access to your interviews, how you do the interviews, you know, but, but the form, the, the, the deed of gift or the release form is a very important kind of thing to, to think about as you start your project. What is the form going to look like? The way the Proctor program uh, does our interviews is, is generally considered best practice within the Oral History Association. Uh, which is that before we even turn on the recorder, um, we share the document, we have the narrator look at the document, uh, take as much time as they need. Um, we have the interviewers review the document as well because both of us are going to sign this Creative Commons license form which is gonna allow us to process the interview and make it accessible to students and, and to scholars. So we don't even, I don't even hit the record button until it's clear that the individual is going to be comfortable with the context of doing the interview and signing the form at the end of the interview, not before the interview. Let me make that, that clear. Um, sometimes we have to, to make this clear to our students. We're not asking people to sign the form in advance of the interview. Uh, we use the form in part um, to remind us how that this is not just a regular conversation. This is a conversation in which knowledge is going to be created and which is going to be recorded for posterity's sake in a public archive. Um, so we don't ask them to sign the form before the interview. Obviously, we, we ask them to sign it after. And then the interview, uh, interviewer signs it as well. And I was just in Pensacola with a field team with Deborah, and we had about five folks, and I was doing about four interviews a day. And it was really fun to kind of reacquaint myself with, with the form and to think about, you know, really what it means to have someone sign a form like this. This is information that could be in a public archive, you know, for a, a millennium or more, you know. And so, did I say that right? Millennium or millennia? Something like that. For a thousand years or more or something, you know. Um, not to get too bombastic. So that was starting an oral history project number one. And so there's other, I'm not going to go through every point. Um, but you can look at the form, and again, uh, th this is a form that's really popular with, with folks now. I really should copyright it, actually, or trademark it, or whatever. Um, so, number two, personal and institutional motivations. The why question. Why do you really want to do this? Believe it or not, when you sit down with a narrator, with an interviewee, uh, oftentimes they're going to ask you, you know, why is my story important? You know, uh, uh, I don't know anything, or I... You know, why do you want to interview me? And that's, it's really important to think about this question in advance. You know, why are we doing what we're doing? You know, we're, we're scholars. We don't engage in projects lightly. We want to have a really good uh, explanation for ourselves, for our, our immediate community of scholars, and for the people that we want to interview, exactly why we want to really do this. Question two. Who will actually benefit from this project? We do things all the time in, in, as scholars to take from communities, to take from neighborhoods, to take from workplaces. We, when I was a grad student, um, I wrote a dissertation that became this book, Emancipation Betrayed. I interviewed many, many African-American, especially working class people in states like Florida, Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, so on and so forth. When I wrote Emancipation Betrayed, this is the book that I earned tenure from. 
at the University of California system. And so, you know, you might say, well, you know, but you didn't really monetize the interviews. But in, in a way, I, these interviews led me to getting an academic job. So we have to understand that when we go out in the field and we're interviewing people, we're getting a lot out of that. And I think it's very important for us to acknowledge the rewards that we're accruing, uh, you know, for doing oral history and to think about what can we give back? Who is going to benefit? Um, it can't just be people in academia. It can't just be people on campus. Because we, alongside of this, whenever you start an oral history project, Think about the impact it's going to have on your relationship to the communities that you want to work with. So, for example, um, if you're in a city and you want to do a long-term oral history project with factory workers um, who may work in an auto plant or in an oil refinery, uh, who do you interview? Uh, do you start by interviewing the managers? If you start by inter interviewing the managers, I can guarantee you one thing. A lot of the workers will never talk to you in a million years. And so you gotta, you got to kind of think about those things. If you're doing a project on gentrification, it's very important to think about working with a community or a neighborhood. Um, if you do a project on gentrification in, in, a, you know, in, in a big city, uh, you're probably not going to start by interviewing uh, real estate developers because these are people who do not have the trust of people in the community. I can guarantee you, I live in a small town. And if you went into our working class neighborhoods and you said, oh, we're doing an oral history project on gentrification, we began by interviewing the three biggest developers in Gainesville, a lot of doors would shut in our face immediately. People will want to have nothing to do with us. So, you know, in a nutshell, think about the ongoing relationship that you're trying to nurture or maintain with different communities um, uh, in, your, in your vicinity. Uh, this could be a national question, you know, it could be, uh, you know, it could be international. You know, so for example, if I'm doing interviews on American politics and I tell people, you know, I'm only talking to, you know, Donald Trump supporters, then obviously that's going to impact, you know, the, the, the rest of, of the project and my relationship to, you know, a larger political community. So point three, you know, the third step, laying the groundwork for an oral history project. Um, oftentimes, as scholars, we get excited and we'll say, hey, we want to go out and, and, and do a, a public event or a public program uh, to be helpful in the community. And um, I just had a meeting with um, one of our community partners a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about things that the Proctor Oral History Program can do to, to benefit the community in terms of sharing knowledge. and. We, on our side as academics, we suggested, oh, we could have these educational programs, you know. And the response was, well, you know, that, that would be nice, but, you know, why don't you instead participate with the programs that are already happening in our community? I mean, it's a college town. There's a lot of educational events already happening. Why don't you go to events and, and you can offer to, to make a presentation or to, to, to share, you know, your work but find events that are already happening. In other words, don't create your own constantly and ask people to come to you because then that sets up a very kind of unequal uh, dynamic. The other part of um, laying the groundwork is to just give yourself a lot of time to engage in discussions with the people you want to partner with. Um, it could be an individual. This summer, I've, I've asked a team of our students focusing on um, Latino history, or Latinx history, to interview a gentleman who's in his mid-70s who has a lifetime of work in the farm worker movement in the United States. And he's also very re uh, religious. And so their preparation is learning not just about him as an individual, but learning about the Christian social gospel, because that's how he defines the, the impetus and the motivations for his work with migrant farm workers. Um, and also, I've asked them to learn about the history of unionism because um, a lot of the work this, this uh, person has done uh, over his lifetime has been with the United Farm Workers Union, the um, Farm Labor Organizing Committee, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. So a lot of our students who are going to be our primary interviewers don't really know much about labor unions. Uh, some of them are very young. 
they may not have done much work, period, like paid work. And so if you said, hey, do you know how to organize a union? They kind of look at you blankly. Uh, but now I'm asking them to interview a man who's about 76, 77 years old. Um, and so, and, and has, has played a big role in supporting unions for farm workers. So the students are gonna have to learn about that. Um, and before they even sit down to talk with him, they'll have you know, some of that, that, that information. The equipment part um, is, is the next step I was going to talk about, but I think I'll defer to Deborah Hendricks about that. But, but equipment is very uh, important, obviously. And Deborah's shaking her head behind the camera just to let you know. Um, so I'm gonna skip ahead to conducting the interview. We've already talked a little bit about this before. Um, I mentioned earlier the Proctor Program recently spent a weekend in Pensacola, Florida, and the, our local contacts in the Chappie James Museum uh, there, which is, which is a new museum um, and has a lot of really cool, amazing people working there, they were the ones that scheduled everything for us. All we really did was show, you know, we showed up to do the interviews. We, we, they, they had rooms for us, they did the scheduling, uh, they did the appointments, and we just, you know, people would come into the conference room where I was interviewing. I'd go over the, the Creative Commons form with them. They would ask me often, and, and this is something I want to mention and kind of um, flag for your, your, uh, your further uh, reflection, if you will. Oftentimes, when I interview people, uh, this, the, the people I'm interviewing will flip the script. What I mean by this is that I come into an interview all excited to talk with them about their life history, where they're from, who they are, who are your people, but they often begin by asking me the same questions. They want to know, like, who are your, uh, who are your people? Where are you from? Why are you doing this? What is your motivation for doing this? Um, who's going to benefit from this? And it's very important to practice uh, those types of, of responses. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying make things up, but I'm just saying think about this, think about your motivations, and think about what you're going to do when people ask you, like, where you're from. Um, and it's very important in terms of, of issues like, say, racial identity. I can remember when I started interviewing African Americans in the Deep South in the early 1990s when I was a grad student, and I would go into the Arkansas Delta or the Black Belt of, of, of Alabama, and people would ask me, my, all of my narrators were, were African American elders, and they would say, well, you know, you're not quite white, are you? Um, where are your people from? Um, and when they find out a little more, they'd say, they'd, they'd say, well, you know, tell me about Mexico. Um, you know, what does it mean to be a Mexican American? Uh, in recent years, people have asked me, oh, oh why do you use that term Latinx? Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is think about your motivations, but also be prepared to, to, <laughs> to answer some of the same questions you may be asking your narrator or your interviewee. Um, respect, privacy, and confidentiality very often we'll do interviews where people want to redact information. And our practice here at the Proctor Program is to redact anything the interviewer or narrator wants us to redact. Um, we've interviewed, in, in fact, I interviewed an individual um, last year um, who had spent, he had a remarkable life uh, and had been incarcerated about 25 years of that remarkable life. Uh, in, in, in a, uh, a state uh, prison and made clear that he didn't want to really talk about that aspect of his life. And so that part of, of the interview is, will be redacted. Um, and, that, and, and it's important to, to go over this in advance. I, I, I kind of do this as my personal practice and you may differ on this or you know, this, a lot of this is obviously not um, you know, this is not a manual, but uh, my personal practice is to kind of preemptively share with the person if there are parts of the interview that you want redacted, that's cool, um, that's fine. Because we're often in the Proctor program interviewing people who have been the sub, you know, who have been the object of a lot of oppression. 
Uh, we're interviewing, you know, immigrant workers. We're interviewing um, African Americans who grew up in the Jim Crow period. Um, we're interviewing labor union organizers who may have been fired for for doing, you know, for organizing a union. And so we feel ethically that it's really important uh, to let those folks know that we don't want the interview to be, you know, used against them in the future because it will be public. And um, I'm sure that um, my colleagues in the library shared with you um, certain case studies. So, you know, like one is we talk a lot about the Boston College case study now where a, um, an, an interview team told former members of the, uh, the Irish Republican Army that they would be able to keep their interviews confidential forever. Um, and that's just not possible because eventually that set of interviews was actually subpoenaed by um, the British government, I think maybe even by the US government. I can't remember now, kind of, I get some of these cases mixed up. But it is important to think about if you're really looking for sensitive, sensitive information to realize that there's a limit to what we can keep confidential. We're not journalists. Uh, we can't say, oh, this is off the record unless we really do expunge it. We can do that. But keep in mind, this is the digital era. And even when we expunge that, and I, Deborah can back me up on this, uh, in the digital era, nothing is ever really expunged. Uh, and so just kind of keep that, keep that in mind. Uh, you know, the other thing about the interview, and I know we talked about this when you're on campus, is the importance of active listening. And what I want to lift up to you is um, some texts that talk about active listening. One is Donald Ritchie's Doing Oral History but really think about what it means to be an active listener as opposed to a passive listener. And this is important, especially if you're teaching a class or if you have a group of interviewers who are students, younger folks, I don't want to stereotype, but we live in a society today where listening is not highly valued because there's, number one, there's so much information, people are bombarded constantly. Like I had to put my phone on silent Right? There's too many, we have too many inputs. Now I'm going to edit, editorialize a little bit. And what that means is we've gotten out of the habit, uh, many of us, of, ha of knowing and practicing the art of dialogue. And I love the phrase art of dialogue. It was actually uh, presented to me in a discussion I had um, with a colleague who was trying, an academic colleague, trying to learn more about oral history. And what she said was, you know, it sounds like what you're doing in oral history is you're, you're kind of recreating the art of dialogue. And that is very true because, I th number one, I think, unfortunately, oftentimes it's a lost art. And number two, we do spend so much time kind of involved in passive, passive listening. So active listening is very important. And, and a way of, 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 of kind of modeling or even doing this is there's a lot of really good, you know, kind of cool memory exercises. You know, there's icebreaker exercises, you know, sitting down with a partner and, you know, running through a list of questions and then repeating back the answers and getting in the habit of, oh, I'm from, you know, I'm from Cleveland or I'm from Barbados or I'm from Mexico City and being able to have a dialogue and to be able to kind of remember, um, you know, what the person told you, that demonstrates that you're kind of learning how to do, you know, how to implement the um, uh, uh, active listening. I'll recap a little bit about thinking about the final project. Um, doing the interview, or even the process of, of setting up the interview is very exciting. When we were in Pensacola, Florida, um, the, you know, the local television sta station came out and did a big uh, story you know, we got on film, our, our community contacts were, were thrilled. Um, it got some print coverage. Oftentimes when you start an oral history project, you get a lot of attention. However, after you do the interview, you know, the attention kind of wanes. And that's where I've seen a lot of oral history projects kind of falter because they have a really good design, they have really good interviews, they, they follow best practices in terms of, of, uh, of archiving or preserving the materials, but then they don't think enough about what happens next. And that's why I love to start with outcomes. And let me mention a few things about, about transcribing and indexing your interview. 
you become a better interviewer by listening and thinking about your craft. It's not that much different than, than writing or public speaking um, or teaching. You know, you, you learn by doing. But with oral history, you forget quickly the kinds of questions you asked in an interview. That's why I encourage our students here and my colleagues and myself to listen to an interview that we, we just conducted or maybe listen to an interview we conducted five or eight years ago. Think about your interview style. This sounds odd, but everyone has an interview style. What is your style like? We like to start interviews in the Proctor program with open-ended questions. Instead of saying, what year were you born? Um, what was your father's occupation? Those are kind of closed-ended questions. I like to start interviews with, what was family life like? Uh, what was the community like where you, where you grew up? That starts in a broader kind of plane and allows a person more freedom. And then we can always get back to the question of when you were born. I mean, usually that comes out anyway. I mean, why? I'm like, why would you ask that question? Because the, the, re the reason to avoid that, by the way, is, and this is going to sound facetious, it is not. We're moving into a census year. And people are so used to being surveyed and answering that question, what year were you born? What is your social security number? Um, we want to kind of get them out of that, that, that mode when we're interviewing them because it's a very different kind of, of interview. Um, and as, as you move beyond the interview, you know, think about how you're going to, to transcribe. The Proctor program has a, a transcription guide uh, Baylor University Oral History Program has a transcription guide. Uh, Columbia has one. Check those out. And I would highly suggest if you're going into the transcription process, I mean, I realize a lot of programs now are moving towards having everything, you know, online without transcribing. Um, I'm at an institution where right now, whenever I make that kind of uh, suggestion, people are not very happy. And so I've kind of, the compromises will continue to transcribe as many of the interviews as we possibly can. It turns out that historians, political scientists, a lot of different disciplines I can name, people prefer to read a transcript. However, I want to emphasize that best practices through the, via the Oral History Association is that if you're a, a researcher and you go to a library, or even if you look at an interview online as a written transcription, best practices say that you should also listen to the interview or watch the interview for your own edification to make sure the transcript matches up with the, the digital uh, production. Now, um, how many of us have the time and space to do that? Let's be, let's be honest. I just want due diligence. I want to give you the best practice, which is that the transcript is not the be-all, end-all of the interview. It's the original um, you know, uh, context, which is the, the recording. Um, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that a lot of institutions don't have the capacity to store the digital uh, recording, uh, especially if it's video. Um, so we have to keep that in mind as well. A couple other things to, to think about. Again, you know, do you want to do a public program? Are you writing a book? Are you doing a digital podcast series? Deborah will talk more about kind of the, the analytical side of digital production. Um, but I wanted to mention some really exciting new books that have come out recently. And I'm, I'm just going to list a few of the books to give you a sense for how oral history is being done uh, and, and, and how and, and some of the outputs of oral history uh, that have come to my attention. This is a new book titled Beyond Women's Words, Feminisms and the Practices of Oral History in the 21st Century. It's a powerful anthology, an oral history anthology. Um, the original Beyond Women's Words was published in uh, 1991, I believe. Uh, Sherna Gluck and other col uh, uh, feminist colleagues published that book. The idea behind the new version of Beyond Women's Words is to say that, you know, feminism is global. And there are interview projects talked about in Beyond Women's Words conducted with women in a whole variety of settings, uh, including war zones, uh, refugee camps, ghettos, 
you know, working class neighborhoods, um, a lot of different contexts. And every single author in this book, by the way, is, is a female author, with the exception of one uh, writer whose name is Paul Ortiz. Uh, but that's that's you know I'm I'm a minority in that in that collection. But it's Beyond Women's Words is a powerful uh, collection. Another really interesting new oral history book, um, and the author's Anne Belay is is titled Semi Queer, Inside the World of Gay, Trans, and Black Truck Drivers. This is really an amazing, poignant, powerful study of you know of I would see it as a labor history. Um, I would see it as LGBT studies, you know, queer studies. Um, but also um, an economic study as well. And the cool thing is you're getting the first-hand viewpoint of these really amazing uh, black truck drivers. Um, another a relatively new book that's just come out um, by Yolanda Castro Presa is titled Weaving Chiapas, Maya Women's Lives in a Changing World. And the exciting thing about this book is that the, the, the interviewers are, you know, interviewed women who are practicing a craft that goes back centuries, many centuries, in terms of weaving and chiapas, and they connect the craft of weaving, you know, clothes, blankets, shelters, with you know the economic and cultural and political lives of, of women in Chiapas and in, and in rural Mexico and indigenous Mexico in general. It's a really cool um, book. Uh, Juan Carnado, uh, uh, has a new book titled, I'm Not Gonna Die in This Damn Place, Manliness, Identity, and Survival of the Mexican-American Vietnam Prisoners of War. This is a serious book, and it, it leads me to kind of, you know, my, my wrapping up and, and concluding points, you know, which is that I often tell people who are skeptical of oral history, you know, why do you do oral history? Can't you, you know, uh, uh, isn't memory fragile? Isn't it, un, you know, uh, undependable? Um, I say that's all fine. Um, if you believe everything your government tells you, then oral history is just a waste of time for you because you know you can just get the information from the government. You know, if you believe if you're a worker and you believe everything your boss or your dean tells you, there's really no need to ask anyone else. You know, you got your marching orders, you you follow them. But if you want to get underneath the surface, underneath surface appearances, get closer to the truth, then you're going to read a book like semi-queer inside the world of gay, trans, and black truck drivers. You're going to read a book like, um, you know, Marsha uh, um, Mahoney's new book, River Voices, Extraordinary Sources from the Wheat. Now, the, the thing about this, though, to, to, to consider is, again, what are going to be the outcomes of, of your oral history project? Is it going to be a book? Is it going to be an audio podcast or a uh, or a documentary? Um, what kind of community and classroom impact is your work going to do? So, because we're an oral history center at the University of Florida, we have the the privilege um, or luxury, I guess you could say, of thinking over a long period of time about a particular interview project. You may not have that luxury. But one of the things we're trying to do is, is to upfront think about how could we plug this interview or this interview project into the classroom. The classroom could be a K through six you know, classroom in the US context, it could be a high school you know, classroom, it could be a university or college classroom, um, it could be an adult lifelong learning context, um, it could be a prison. And we've worked with people in, in prisons as well. Um, but again, that question is, you know, what are the, the you know, what will be the, the, the different ways that the oral history work we do in academia can benefit and kind of, you know, uh, echo and amplify throughout the rest of the world. So I think I probably have talked too long, uh, but again, thank you for your patience. Um, and now you get a chance to hear from uh, uh, digital production coordinator, Deborah Hendricks.